Eddie sped off, nearly doubling the speed limit the rest of the way home. He hasn't talked about that night or gone fishing with us since. This story dates back to when I was a senior in high school. I'm 25 now, but I can still remember it like it happened yesterday. I was walking to my dad's house after spending some time with my then girlfriend. It was around 9 p.m. There was a shortcut next to a lake that I usually took to get back to my dad's place. The lake itself was used as a dumping ground. Every week or so, some people would back their trucks up to the lake and throw garbage into it. This was definitely not the kind of lake you would want to swim in. People around here had claimed to see alligators, but I'd never caught a glimpse of one myself. As I passed by the dark water, I felt that something was off, like I was being followed. The street lights weren't working that night, so it was dark and I couldn't see much of my surroundings. But something told me to walk faster, so I did. My dad's house was just around the corner. After a few more steps, it became undeniable that something was behind me. I thought perhaps someone was looking to rob me, which would have been scary enough on its own. From the road up ahead, I heard somebody honking. I then saw a guy driving a moped, and that's when I turned around. I didn't see anything behind me except for a very tall palm tree. The tree had to be more than 10 feet high, and the leaves were shaking. There was no wind out that night, so something had to have knocked against it to cause that disturbance. The guy on the moped circled back, then stopped on the side of the road and shouted to me, I don't know what was just following you, but you had better get out of there. I was thoroughly creeped out at this point, and I quickly closed the gap between where I was and the safety of the street. What? What did you see? I asked, my heart pounding. When I was passing by, I saw something behind you, he replied. It looked strange, and it was moving. My girlfriend's father once shared a story with me. To avoid any confusion, I'll recount it exactly as he told it to me, from the perspective of her father, myself, and some friends, whom we all referred to as Ralph and Eddie. We decided to take a fishing trip together. It was a way to escape from our daily lives for a while. The day went off without a hitch. Many joints were smoked. Many beers were consumed, and there were plenty of laughs between old friends. If you're familiar with the state of Massachusetts, you'll know of a certain area in the southeast called the Bridgewater Triangle. That's where we found ourselves. For me, I returned home to my wife and kids the following day. Eddie, however, called me up. Hi, Ed, he said. I had a lot of fun yesterday. We need to do it again soon. Yesterday, I replied, puzzled. You mean the worst night of my life. I was dumbfounded. In my mind, Ralph, Eddie, and I had a great time. But after that phone call ended, I fully understood what had happened. While driving home, Eddie was heading down a back road through a town called Bridgewater. After taking a left onto a dark road, he traveled for a few more miles and saw what seemed to be an injured man hobbling his way down the pitch black road. Being the kind individual he was, he pulled up alongside the man. Now he was able to see him up close. The man looked like he'd been in a horrible car accident. Mounted to Ed's truck was a movable light and he positioned it to face the man before asking, Hey buddy, are you okay? Once the light hit the man's face, Ed's blood ran cold. Imagine seeing the body of a man who had just gone through an airplane propeller, but was somehow still held together. The man's large eyeballs were hanging from his face. The creature's only response was to crook its broken head and ask, can I get a ride? It struggled to speak 
Croaking out its words from a torn, worn-out throat, Eddie stared at this abomination for what could have been no more than ten. Eddie sped off, nearly doubling the speed limit the rest of the way home. He hasn't talked about that night, or gone fishing with us since. This story dates back to when I was a senior in high school. I'm 25 now, but I can still remember it like it happened yesterday. I was walking to my dad's house after spending some time with my then-girlfriend. It was around 9 p.m. There was a shortcut next to a lake that I usually took to get back to my dad's place. The lake itself was used as a dumping ground. Every week or so, some people would back their trucks up to the lake and throw garbage into it. This was definitely not the kind of lake you would want to swim in. People around here had claimed to see alligators, but I'd never caught a glimpse of one myself. As I passed by the dark water, I felt that something was off, like I was being followed. The streetlights weren't working that night, so it was dark, and I couldn't see much of my surroundings. But something told me to walk faster, so I did. My dad's house was just around the corner. After a few more steps, it became undeniable that something was behind me. I thought perhaps someone was looking to rob me, which would have been scary enough on its own. From the road up ahead, I heard somebody honking. I then saw a guy driving a moped, and that's when I turned around. I didn't see anything behind me, except for a very tall palm tree. The tree had to be more than 10 feet high, and the leaves were shaking. There was no wind out that night, so something had to have knocked against it to cause that disturbance. The guy on the moped circled back, then stopped on the side of the road and shouted to me, I don't know what was just following you, but you had better get out of there. I was thoroughly creeped out at this point, and I quickly closed the gap between where I was and the safety of the street. What? What did you see? I asked, my heart pounding. When I was passing by, I saw something behind you, he replied. It looked strange and it was moving. Continuing the story. Cave. Jake and I were well prepared with flashlights, backpacks, and some snacks for the journey ahead. We were excited, but also a little nervous given the ominous rumors about the cave. As we started down the trail, the shadows grew longer, and the woods became quieter. The dense trees seemed to close in around us. Despite our unease, we pressed on, curiosity driving us forward. After what felt like a quarter mile, we reached the fork in the path. It was eerily quiet. The forest was still, and even the leaves didn't seem to rustle. We exchanged a look, the tension palpable. With a gulp, we turned left, following the instructions we had been given. Minutes passed, and the anticipation in the air was thick. Our flashlights cut through the darkness, casting eerie shadows on the trees. It felt like we were walking deeper into a world of uncertainty. Finally, we stumbled upon the cave. Its entrance was dark and foreboding. A black void in the woods. Our flashlights revealed the gaping maw of the cave, and we couldn't see how deep it went. Goosebumps ran down our arms. As we stood there, contemplating whether to enter or not, a strange noise echoed from the depths of the cave. It was a low, guttural growl like nothing we had ever heard before. Fear surged through us, and we quickly decided it was best to leave. We didn't want to find out what was making that sound. We retraced our steps, back to the fork in the path, our hearts pounding all the way. But as we made our way back to the main trail, an unsettling feeling washed over us. It was as if we were being watched, just as our unease reached its peak, a voice called out from the trees. Hey, you kids okay? Startled, we 
we turned to see a park ranger emerging from the woods. Relieved, we told him about our plan to explore the cave and the strange growl we had heard. The ranger's expression grew serious. You're lucky I found you in time. That cave is dangerous, and there are wild animals in these woods. It's not a safe place to be after dark. With a shiver down our spines, we thanked the ranger profusely. As he led us back to the main entrance, we couldn't help but wonder what could have happened if he hadn't intervened. The mysteries of the cave remained unsolved, but our adventure had taught us a valuable lesson about the dangers that lurked in the unknown. To head back soon, my curfew's coming up and I don't want to get into trouble, I called out. There was no response from within the cave, just an eerie silence that sent shivers down my spine. I waited a few more minutes, growing increasingly anxious. The darkness was deepening, and the ominous feeling in the air was overwhelming. Jake, I shouted, my voice quivering. We really need to go now. Still, there was no reply. Panic began to well up inside me as I considered the possibility that something might have happened to Jake in the cave. My concern outweighed my fear, and I made up my mind to go in after him. I pulled out my flashlight, clicked it on, and cautiously entered the cave. The narrow entrance gave way to a larger, dimly lit chamber. The walls were covered in graffiti, and the air was thick with a musty, unpleasant odor. Jake, I called out again, my voice echoing through the cave. But there was no response. I ventured further, my flashlight beam revealing a series of interconnected chambers. It was like a maze inside, and I had no idea where Jake could be. The eerie silence persisted, broken only by the sound of dripping water. My heart pounded in my chest as I continued to explore, my anxiety growing with each passing moment. Suddenly, I heard a faint sound from deeper within the cave. It was a low, guttural growl, and it sent a chill down my spine. Jake? Is that you? I whispered, my voice trembling. No response, just the ominous growl growing louder. My flashlight beam danced over the walls, revealing strange markings and symbols. Panic overtook me, and I turned to retreat, desperate to get out of that unsettling place. But as I made my way back towards the entrance, something blocked my path. It was a figure, tall and shadowy, standing between me and the exit. I froze in terror my flashlight trembling in my hand. The figure began to move closer, its features shrouded in darkness. Fear coursed through me as I realized that this was not Jake. It was something else, something inexplicable and terrifying. I dropped my flashlight, turned, and ran as fast as my legs could carry me through the twisting chambers of the cave back towards the entrance. The growls and eerie noises pursued me, and I could feel something chasing me in the darkness. Finally, I burst out into the open air, gasping for breath. I didn't stop running until I reached the abandoned parking lot where we had left our bikes. Jake was nowhere to be seen, and the forest was cloaked in darkness. Tears welled up in my eyes, as I grabbed my bike and pedaled back towards town. My mind raced with thoughts of what might have happened to Jake, and I knew that I had to get help. The cave of hell had lived up to its sinister reputation, and I feared that my friend had fallen victim to whatever malevolent force lurked within its depths. In the cave, and there was no way we were going back to retrieve them. The terror in Jake's voice was palpable as we pedaled furiously away from that nightmarish place. The screeching and howling continued to echo through the woods, 
pursuing us as if it were a relentless predator. Adrenaline surged through our veins, and we pushed our bikes to their limits. I couldn't help but glance back as we rode, and what I saw chilled me to the bone. Emerging from the cave was a creature unlike anything I had ever imagined. It had a pair of antlers on its head, but it certainly wasn't a moose. Its body was grotesquely contorted, standing on its hind legs, and its eyes gleamed with an unnatural malevolence. We didn't dare slow down, even for a second, as we desperately tried to put distance between ourselves and that abomination. It seemed as though the creature was keeping pace with us, and the screeching grew louder, sending shivers down my spine. Finally, we burst out of the woods and onto the abandoned parking lot, our hearts pounding in our chests. The creature didn't follow us out of the forest, but its eerie screeches still echoed in our ears. We didn't stop until we reached Jake's house, both of us out of breath and drenched in sweat. We tried to make sense of what had just happened, but it was impossible to rationalize the cave of hell had lived up to its name, and we had narrowly escaped whatever malevolent force dwelled within its depths. Days turned into weeks, and Jake and I never spoke of that horrifying encounter again. We couldn't explain what we had seen, and we didn't want to relive the sheer terror of that night. One thing was for certain. We had entered a realm of darkness and malevolence that defied explanation. The cave of hell would forever remain a chilling and enigmatic memory, a place best left unexplored by anyone seeking adventure in the woods outside of Kingwood. In the cave, the rest of the trip home is a blur to me. By the time we got back to my house, my parents had already called the cops. We told the police and our parents that an animal had chased us in the forest. The genuine fear in our eyes helped the lie. We didn't want to sound like we were making excuses for being out so late, and something had chased us, but it definitely was not an animal. Jake and I went our separate ways after that night. I'm sorry to say that he died from an overdose not too long ago. I never got the full story from Jake as to what exactly he saw in that cave. Whatever he experienced must have left a lasting impact on him. It traumatized him, and he turned to drugs to bury his fears. We never went back to retrieve our phones for obvious reasons. I moved away from Kingwood about a year later, and aside from attending Jake's funeral, I've never been back there. There's always a reason to be afraid. The memories of that night in the cave and its lingering mystery continue to haunt me. The memories of that night in the cave and its lingering mystery continue to haunt me. As the years have passed, I've come to realize that some secrets are better left buried, that there are depths of darkness in this world we may never fully understand. Jake's tragic end serves as a painful reminder that sometimes the unknown can consume us. Life has moved on, and I've tried to find solace in the present. But that eerie experience will forever be a part of my past. It's a story I'll carry with me. A reminder that there are places and events that defy explanation. Perhaps one day, I'll gather the courage to return to Kingwood and face the unresolved questions from that fateful night. But for now, I'm content to let the mysteries of the cave remain in the shadows.